Good morning and welcome to Mount Lebanon United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Kelly and I'd like to thank you for being here today or on whatever day you watch this service. We are celebrating, as you can tell, Baptism of the Lord Sunday. We see that in our bulletins. Now, the only important announcements I have for you are that there is a worship team meeting this coming Wednesday, January 13th, and then the next Wednesday we're having mission team both at 7 p.m. on Zoom. So if you are on that committee and you did not receive your Zoom invitation, please let me know because they have already gone out. And if you are not on that committee and you just want to hang out with us, let me know. I'll send it to you. Because all committees except SPRC are welcome for all the church to attend. Those are the only announcements I have for you. I'm going to turn it on over to Christian so that we can start our time of worship. I invite you to say with me the call to worship found in your bulletins. I will be the leader if you will be the people. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Glory of his powerful, the voice of, oh, sorry. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May, May the, the Lord, Lord give strength, strength to his people. Our opening hymn is number 152. I sing the almighty power of God.
please join me as we welcome the Lord God into our hearts and minds this morning in saying the opening prayer, and it can be found in your bulletin. O Father in heaven, who at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan proclaimed him your beloved Son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit, grant that all who are baptized into his name may keep the covenant they have made and boldly confess him as Lord and Savior, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. And as we remember the things that we believe about that one God in glory everlasting, we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It is now time for our children's sermon, so if you have any little ones with you today, I invite them to come forward so that they can see and hear me clearly. I have a special thing to show you, and it might not be that special, but what do I have right here? Can you hear that? What do I have right here? I have my keys. That's right. I have my car keys, which doesn't look like a key because it's remote. And then I have these keys that do something special. What do keys do, friends? They open things. That's right. You put them in doors, or if it's a car key, you click a button and it opens something for you, right? So I have those keys, and they're used to start things and help us enter buildings and help us do things. And today, we're going to talk about Jesus' baptism, which is like a key to help us in our faith and make us strong. So it can help us to go and be Christians, to enter into a Christian life. So when we talk about baptism. Some of you might be baptized, some of you might not be. But what does it mean? It means to sprinkle or pour on or cover a person with water. What we like to do is, there's a font over there, you can't see it. But what we like to do is fill it with water and then sprinkle or kind of scoop onto somebody's head. Why would we do that in the middle of church? Why would we want to go swimming in the middle of church? Well, because it's a sign that that person belongs to Jesus. Sometimes churches do this in rivers. Sometimes they do it in pools. Sometimes it happens with a little bowl of water like we have in our church. And during Jesus' life, people were being baptized and dipped under the water of the Jordan River. John the Baptist was doing all of this. And it meant that God would wash away, like water, all of their mistakes and our failure to be perfect followers of God and claim us to live a fresh new life. And when Jesus was a young man, he went to John the Baptist to be baptized. And he was a, John the Baptist was actually his cousin. I bet that was pretty cool. And he was a man who was telling people to follow God and John would baptize them. Well, Jesus came and wanted to be baptized too. And there was a voice from God that came down when Jesus came up from the water and said, you are my son and I love you. I am very pleased. And a dove came down from heaven. And that's why when you look at a lot of stained windows, like maybe the kind we have in our church or a lot of Christian signs, they have doves on them. Because we remember that Jesus was baptized and a dove appeared. That's also a symbol for the Holy Spirit, which is also God. So today, 
when we baptize people, we do it because Jesus was baptized too. And because we want our sins to be washed away and we want to, uh, even though we're not perfect followers of God, we know that when we're baptized, God loves us anyway. And that's why we do it. And whenever it's done, we remind ourselves that God chooses us and is pleased with us, just like God was with Jesus. So we're going to pray this prayer to help us all remember that God loves us. Okay, let's put our praying hands together. Repeat after me. Oh God, help me to live as your child and to remember how much you love me. Amen. Thank you, friends. I am so glad that we were together today through a virtual computer. I'm so happy that you were with us. And if you want to stick around, there's some special music we're about to hear from Mr. Christian and Miss Courtney. They're going to sing and play, Wash Us as Your Sons and Daughters. so much for bringing your special music with us and I don't know if you can feel the Holy Spirit in here from over the you know internet but I hope you can because I think all of us in this room can feel it too at least I have a couple nods of heads that's our prayer we want to be transformed well as we prepare to hear the word proclaimed among us this morning let us Pray together our prayer for illumination found in your bulletins. 
holy God, word made flesh. Let us come to this word, open to being surprised, silence our agendas, banish our assumptions, cast out our casual detachment, confound our expectations, clear the cobwebs from our ears, penetrate the corners of our hearts with this word. We know that we can, that you can, we pray that you will, and we wait with great anticipation. Amen. Our Old Testament reading comes to us from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. We're going to hear about why we need baptism and why we need the Lord to transform us. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Well, that was some fun, was it not, church? So we're going to hear from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And it says in the bulletin that we'll be reading from Acts. But um, I changed it this morning. We're going to be reading from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Note that Mark does not begin with the birth of Christ like the other gospel, or meant two of the other gospels do. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let me tell you a story. It's about a guy I'm pretty sure you've heard about. God spoke to him very strongly, which resulted in a complete upending of his life. Everything that he knew changed because of an encounter that he had with Jesus. He became convinced of the gospel, that Jesus was God incarnate, and was raised from the dead, and came to bring salvation, not only to the Jews of ancient Israel, but to all of the nations. While he had been a persecutor of the early church, having been educated in the Pharisaic tradition with great emphasis on God's covenant with the Hebrews, Israelites. He then became a champion of faith in Christ. You see, when you hear God speaking to you, you truly believe that message and write it on your heart and believe so much in what God has told you, you will go to the ends of the earth for it. 
And that's exactly what this man did. Have you figured out who he is yet? Here's a hint. We owe half of the New Testament to him. That's right. I'm talking about Paul the Apostle. Some of you might know and some of you might not be familiar with how scriptural accounts detail this first big meeting between prominent leaders of the early church. And no, I'm not talking about the Council of Nicaea, which happened, uh, which produced the first creed to differentiate the truth from heresy that would happen 300 years in the future. No, I'm referring to the Jerusalem Council, or what some people call the Apostolic Council. The book of Acts of the Apostles and Paul's letter to the Galatians both tell the story, but they tell it differently. But in Paul's account, the 12 disciples and other missionaries and leaders all came together on equal footing to decide what to do as a whole church about one problem that everybody had been having. And that problem was the Jewish versus Gentile Christians thing. Some said, well, in order to follow Jesus, we also have to follow the Jewish law. And some said, well, Jewish law is important to tell us about how God became known to us, but following the rules isn't necessary anymore. I'm oversimplifying it because the debate was really quite prolific, but at stake for Paul in the issue of Gentile inclusion in the gospel was salvation itself. His argument, which you can check out if you want to open your Bibles to Galatians 2, is that those who believe that following the law is necessary for Christian faith, specifically he talks about circumcision and dietary regulations, those who believe that are putting their faith in justification by works rather than justification by given by faith in Christ alone. For Paul, there's a unity of all people given under Christ's sacrifice, and that is diminished if one focuses too much on following the rules. After all, why were the rules there in the first place? Well, to help people follow the covenant, which brings them into a saving relationship with God. But if Jesus accomplishes the relationship with God part, do we need the old rules now? Paul would say not, right? Obviously, it's worth remembering for us that the Old Testament is not superseded somehow by the New, but that it rather tells the first half of humanity's story with God and provides us with insight about who God is and what God is all about. Some Christians believe we can just chuck it, right? But we know that we can't. It's part of our scripture. It helps us to figure out what's important to God and so what should be important for us too. It's just that Jesus is the one who saves us, not the things we do, not following the law. That's Paul's argument, and that's our argument, too, as Christians. But the first church, and I use that word loosely because there wasn't a unified church in Paul's time, but rather there were separate gatherings of worshipers and believers scattered throughout the region. The first church had to figure it all out. They had to decide whether or not the rules were important if they were to find unity as one. But more than this, Paul helps them to see during this council that the rules had no bearing on our salvation, and that Jesus did that for us. To clarify again, he shares in his letters that by no means does this allow us to just do whatever we want in life with no regard for God or others, but it just means that God loves us and will continue to show up for us, regardless of whether or not we eat certain foods, right? Why am I telling you this story about Paul and his drastic commitment to the gospel for all people? Well, because I feel like hope and the hope that he held out in the gospel is Paul's game. And hope is one category of which I've been fresh out this week. If you're like me, maybe you've watched on the news, or in my case, read from multiple news sources about the attack by extremist domestic terrorists on our Capitol building earlier this week. There's a lot of information. There's also a lot of misinformation going on around this. But it has been very difficult for most of us to see that there is a strong group of Americans out there 
that are willing to undermine our nation's foundations of democracy, the peaceful transition of power, and even our trust in each other. The spirit of divisiveness that generated throughout time from many different sources in our country, both right and left wing, has brought us to this point where the prevailing feeling is that there are two types of Americans, Republicans and Democrats, and that they are mutually exclusive, completely different, and each believes the other side is completely loony. Am I right? How are we going to move forward as a nation when we can't even talk to each other? How are we going to be brothers and sisters for months, years, decades, centuries to come without another civil war happening? And there are some crazies who do call for a second civil war. Things that are happening in our country are things that many Americans are willing to kill each other over. We've seen that time and time again. How is this situation ever going to work itself out? So if you're like me, thoughts of hopelessness pervaded your week. Worry for the future of our nation. Worry for friends and family living in D.C. Maybe still utter shock at the proceedings or maybe even conflicting feelings. Some of us have felt inundated by conflict on our social media, whether invited or uninvited. The truth is that from school age, we're instructed to believe that the foundations of our country, the paradigm of our representative democracy, is all of these things are completely unshakable. That the gospel of democracy that our country spreads throughout the world is unilaterally accepted by our own citizens. And I think that's where a lot of fear and confusion stems, because it's not. But even more than putting our faith in man-made systems, which... What may hurt the most is that many of the capital attackers waved Christian flags or crosses or signs that Jesus saves in the footage that we've seen, in the photos that we've viewed. And this happened on Epiphany Day, when we recognize, as one friend put it, that Jesus alone is Lord. The power-hungry Herods of the world come to nothing, and our kingdom is not of this world. How hopeless I feel. And perhaps you feel as well, when we are shocked once again into recollection that violence and rage still power our world, that perhaps we've learned nothing from the crusades of the Middle Ages that brought death and loss to so many, and that the Jesus of compassion and mercy, who calls us to unity in our higher citizenship in heaven, is not the same Jesus that some other people recognize and worship. I wonder if hopelessness is how Paul felt sometimes. In his journey to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, he wandered throughout the entire known world in his time. I'm reminded of one of the last passages we read in Acts when we did our lectionary Bible study this fall, when Paul was being shipped to Rome, literally on a ship, for a trial under Caesar with Roman soldiers guarding him on this boat. He'd been arrested for rabble-rousing in Jerusalem, and he had to get ready to plead his case. But honestly, Rome was a goal of his, remember. He had planned to reach the farthest corners of his known world to preach the gospel. And once he got to Rome, he'd be even closer to doing that. But the trial could end his life before he got the chance, couldn't it? A very possible outcome, especially given the fact that he was beheaded during his second trial in Rome just years later, it would be insult to injury. He'd make it to his destination only to be killed before he does what he's given his life to do. So he's on the boat, wondering how God could possibly get him through this. How can God change the situation? How can God make a way where there is none? I wonder if Paul felt as hopeless as I have this week. But still, the scripture speaks. Today, the baptism of Christ in Mark's gospel reveals to us a Jesus who is God's son, who is divine himself, whose power can never be so submerged by the waters of the chaos of our world that it fails to shine forth like a dove. 
even though we bring our hopelessness to the passage with us this morning or whenever you're watching this, God reminds us that our hope lies in something bigger than the River Jordan, more powerful than the Herods and the Caesars of our current time, more unshakable than even the foundations of our democracy. Paul knew that. Hope is what Paul was all about. He'd constantly seen God making a way, changing him from a persecutor of the church to one of its biggest evangelists, converting jailers to orchestrate a prison break, allowing him safety and provision in his journey from city to city, or even giving him the relative freedom of house arrest during his imprisonment. He had seen God do all kinds of miracles in his life. So maybe he didn't feel hopeless. Maybe he knew that God had it under control all along. I think that's what the baptism of Christ can teach us. It's God's promise of a good future, a salvation for all of God's children and all creation in the resurrection of all things. When the world tries to submerge that future, that hope, that salvation, Jesus pops back up out of the water. Jesus pops back up from the dead. Paul, the baptism of Christ, the resurrection, they all teach us that hope is our greatest weapon against the evils we find in this world, even the evils that divide us. Is not Jesus and our faith in Christ an assurance of things hoped for? That's in Hebrews 11.1. 1. The baptism of Christ is an initial promise of the resurrection, which turned out to be a foretaste of the reordering of all sin and chaos in the world, which will come in God's time. In that, we can place our hope. That's why baptism is so powerful. It's a manifestation of that promise that God's made to us. It's that hope that God places us, in us, that sustains us even when we feel hopeless in our world of chaos, in our world of division, in our world of Americans against each other. It's that confidence in the resurrection of Christ in which we have a powerful, tangible truth that God has not forgotten us and never will. So I promise you, no matter which side you're on, all is not hopeless. All is not lost. You can never be so far submerged in the waters of chaos that God can't reach you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you from all different areas of thought and politics. But what matters is that we're one under you. Sometimes we don't feel that way because our world doesn't feel that way. But we know that in you we place our hope that this is not the end of the story wherever we find ourselves. That we are not alone. That we have a family in Christ, who can support us, who can help us bear our burdens, help us talk it out, help us to repent when we've done wrong against our brother and sister, help us to turn back to you every single day and make that decision and commitment. We pray for the healing of this world that as it is and feels so divided, so angry, that we can be a model as Christians of what it looks like to truly love one another, despite any differences. If the early Jews and early Gentiles could do that, I think maybe we can too. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
our hymn of response is about the baptism of Christ, and it's number 252, When Jesus Came to Jordan. to that time in our service when we share with one another the blessings that we've received over the past week and also the prayer concerns that we have both for those within our congregation and throughout the world. I haven't heard anything new this week but as you'll remember last week we shared a thanksgiving that Lynn is as far as we know cancer free and uh, we, she was saying unofficially so because officially you have to wait five years uh, for you to be officially in remission. But we give praise to God for her healing. And we also pray for our sister Sue, who is working through a diagnosis and treatment for cancer. Cancer is something that plagues so many people in our lives, and we offer them all to God. We also continue to pray for Jeff, and we give thanks that Becky is back to work and seems to be doing pretty well with her hand surgery recovery. So if you see her out and about, she'll just have a little tiny scar, but it's not so bad, and she's doing great. So we give thanks for that. We also keep in our prayers all of those who are affected by COVID-19. We've been saying this for months and months and months, but it seems to be even worse now by the statistics than it was in April. So we continue to keep all of those who are suffering in our prayers, including some within our congregation who have long-term symptoms from having had the virus. We know that is something that can happen. In that same vein, there are some of us who have loved ones that we're unable to visit due to restrictions and that we are unable to see or spend time with including uh, Jane Prattley. I know that Peter is really struggling with that as Jane continues to decline in health. So we keep Peter and Jane and all of you who have loved ones that you're unable to see or spend time with in our prayers. 
we especially keep in our prayers to our whole nation. Because there are people in this church of two different sides. There are people in this town of two different sides. I pray that our differences will not keep us from being brothers and sisters in Christ. And like I said in our email that I sent out to all of you, you know, our church has been a bulwark of that, of loving one another, despite any differences that we have. And I want us to continue doing that. Keep doing what you're doing, church. Because we're an example of how you can love one another, even though you might be very different. Well, let us offer up our prayers. Lord, we often find ourselves lost, wandering without purpose, meaning, value, acceptance, place. But you remind us that the Spirit of God descends like a dove upon us. We hear the ancient words that name us and claim us as children of God. We are cleansed, refreshed, and made new in the love of those words for us. Our baptismal vows call us to compassion and mercy on behalf of those in need. So we offer our prayers for the church and the world, especially our prayers for Lynn, Sue, Jeff, Becky, Tracy, Peter and Jane, Sherry, Jay, Christopher, and all of those whom we name in our hearts before you right now. You remember that while all might seem hopeless to us at one point or another in our lives, whether due to illness or catastrophe or an inner struggle we're having, you're still God. And Lord God, you revealed your son in the waters of the Jordan and anointed him with the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim good news to all people. We pray that you sanctify us by the same spirit that we may proclaim the healing power of the gospel by acts of love in your name. These things we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, with whom you are well pleased today and all days. As we pray together the prayer that he taught us in his life. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. for all of the offerings of faith and time and witness and funds and all of the ways in which you have continued to be the church in the world. Because if this time of pandemic can remind us of anything, it's that the church is not a building. The church is a people. You are what make this a church. You are what make this place holy because you are holy in the living sacrifice to Jesus. So, once again, we know that we're not able to be here together, but we are able to send in our funds to keep the ministries of this church alive during this season of pandemic. I thank all of you who have continued to be able to do that through your tithes and offerings. 
both that you've mailed to the church and those that you have given online. But I also know that not all of us are able to continue to give in the ways that we'd like to. I do not want to diminish the sacrifices that you all make in your daily lives, whether maybe you volunteer or help a neighbor or console a friend. You're doing God's work in the world, and that's what we're supposed to do. Amen? So let us offer a prayer over those gifts which we have given and will give this week. Holy God, creator of light and herald of goodness, at the waters of baptism you proclaimed Jesus, your beloved Son. With the baptized of every time and generation, and by these offerings that we give back to you, we are saying yes to your call to repentance. As we are led to the life of abundance we experience in your kinship, and your love. Bless us and keep us, and help all of these gifts to further your mission in the world. Amen. today comes to us from this little book, which of course you have a, a, a copy online, but it is number 2251. It's called, We Were Baptized in Christ Jesus.
daughters of chaos of our lives, we know that God doesn't leave us submerged. God reached in and Jesus popped out of the water. God reached in and Jesus popped up from the dead. This is the gospel given for us. May we take faith and hope from it. And may God bless us and keep us till we meet again. Amen.